This is a meeting of RR. My name is Roche, and I'm a recovering racist. And I'm serious. I'm a recovering racist. And I want to tell you why I say that. Dick. Africa is not a country, in case you didn't know that. When people say they're going to Africa, it's like they think, okay, it's a country. And like, you know what, you know, I'm going to Kenya, I'm going to Ghana, or this, and like, okay. You do know Africa is huge. If you take the size of Europe, it's dinky toy, 300 million people there. Africa is a couple sizes that of, of, of Europe. And the reason that South Africa exists is this main reason that people try to find a route from Europe to India that's over here. And so Vasco da Gama from Portugal came down this coast, he planted some monuments in southwest Africa, which is now Namibia and South Africa, in the 1400s. And Columbus and uh, Americo de Despucci, which our country is named after America, went that side to try and get to the Indies. The reason that they tried to get to the Indies is because the Suez Canal didn't exist. So you all remember Marco Polo? from uh, 1200 from Italy. He went overland to uh, China and Mongolia and overland back. It took him a couple of years. So they didn't have that time. They've tried to find a quicker route and they found the quickest route, whether you were from Portugal, Spain, England or Holland, was to go around Africa and go to India. But the problem is that people, especially the sailors, don't get enough fresh fruit and vegetables and so they got scurvy. And they said, well, we have to build a halfway station. And the first people to do it were the Dutch. Go down. The Dutch came, and right there in Cape Town, they settled and started a colony of sailors. So that when the sailors came there, next one, um, that they had a halfway station. But they weren't the first there. From the 800s, people in Africa were moving. If you read geographical reports, you'll see that in places like Egypt, there were giraffes and hippos and wildlife, and this part of North Africa grew much drier. And so people migrated, they moved, including people from Central Africa, moved into what is Zimbabwe, Zambia, Mozambique, and South Africa. Next slide. So by the time that the whites arrived, you already had big clans, the Bantu stands. Bantu means uh, a word for collective word for African groups. And then you had the Khoi Khoi. The Khoi Khoi are more yellow people. It's the Bushmen, uh, people that live by the big diamond hole by Kimberley, uh, the, the Namakwa landers. So different groups of people had settled the country. And so you can imagine if the whites arrive here, what are they going to get? They're not alone. Next one. And so the Khoi Khoi were nomadic people. They went after their cattle and their sheep. They built little huts from uh, different kinds of material. And these were portable. And they could move from, group, from place to place because they were moving after their animals. Next one. Kaza. Can you say Kaza? No. <laughs> Click your tongue. Kaza. Kaza. So the Kaza is the typical woman, what they dress. No, go back. The typical Kaza women, the typical Kaza men, they were sheep and cattle herders. Very proud nation. And so, next slide. When the whites came on April the 6th in uh, 1652, they were not alone. And so they started this halfway station so that the men, the sailors, could rest out. And the rest of the sailors would then go to India. They would rest out there, send a brand new bunch of sailors to the Cape. They would rest out, and the ones who rested would then go to Holland. And this way, the Dutch Indies, Dutch India, they controlled the spice route from Europe to, to India. And that's the reason South Africa was born. Next one. Now go back. So what happened is you have these paintings of the meetings between what they saw was uncivilized people versus they themselves. Calvinist Christian civilized, and they saw themselves as bringing God's word to those that were uncivilized, dark Africa. And so you have this paternalistic, we are the, the people with culture, as of the folks that we are coming to don't have a culture. And this is the root foundation of apartheid, 
of segregation and separateness. That one culture is superior to another culture. And that your culture can dominate. And you can enforce your culture on another one. And force that culture to make changes to become your culture. And so they met. They traded uh, uh, beads. And they traded cattle for uh, nice shiny things that came from Europe. And so the trade happened. And when the trade didn't happen, they simply stole it. They would steal the cattle, they would kill them, and they would enslave the koi koi. What happened also is they said, well, we don't have enough workers because, you know, we are sailors and we have the right to let people come and work for us. And so they would go to Batavia. And Ernest Chuck is very familiar with that. Indonesia, Batavia, those countries. And bring Malaysian slaves from Malaysia to South Africa. And then these sailors would marry the Malaysian slaves or the koi koi and have children with them. And this is why South Africa today has four ethnic groups. You have the white descendants. They are either German, Dutch, French, English. You have Portuguese and uh, Greek. And then you have three other groups. The one group called colored. Colored group in, in the U.S. is a derogatory term in South Africa. It's a legal people group. The colored group is the mixture of whites and the Malaysian slaves and the koi koi. And the colored group is neither black neither white. And they have been the lost generation in all of these 400 years because they don't belong to either group that is in power. Currently it's the blacks. For 400 years it was the whites. And so they are disenfranchised. Most of the colored folks, 80 to 90 percent, live around Cape Town, that area, about a million and a half. You have the blacks. There is no one black group. There's 11 official languages in South Africa. Afrikaans, English, and then nine indigenous languages like Kwaza, Zulu, Pedi, Sutu, Venda, uh, etc., etc. And so in South Africa alone, you have about 23 different ethnic groups and languages. And when you go to Africa, it's the same. Kikuyu is just one of the languages in Kenya. You have so many dialects and languages that there's no one ethnic group. And even among the ethnic groups, they would fight among themselves. The Zulu are the proud warriors, while some of the other groups were shepherds and herders and cattlemen. So they were peace-loving people. So there is no one, oh, these are the blacks of South Africa. And when we get later in the story, you'll see how these things played out. And then the third uh, big ethnic group besides them is the, uh, the Indian people, which we will get in a short while. So let's go down. Cape Town, most gorgeous city possibly in the world. You have the wonderful weather. This is the new soccer stadium. You have Lion's Head, you have Table Mountain, uh, pushed up by the ocean. Next one, uh, the harbor, just amazing city. Next one, you have the southern point of Africa. Next one, and Cape of Good Hope. And Cape, it was called the Cape of Storms because so many ships sank there. And it can get vicious. And so this is the most su southern tip of Africa, is in South Africa. Next one. Anybody know what this is? What is it called? Robin Island. A rob, a seal. Rob, Robin, the uh, Dutch word for more than one seal. So seal island, Robin Island. It's only six kilometers from Cape Town. Nobody has ever successfully escaped from it. And so they took this beautiful island and made it a prison. And so people, uh, the, 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 there's Cape Town. The castle was built right there below Cape Table Mountain. And from the early times, they would send prisoners to uh, Robben Island as a prison colony, a pineal colony, much like Alcatraz. Okay, next one. Is that where Nelson Mandela Yes. Is? And so you have the movement from Cape Town out. <laughs> These people were much like the American people who came from the east to the west. There was this, we have this great land available. Why must we be stuck over here? They were farmers and, and herders of cattle and sheep. And they said, we need grazing land. And so they started to move out all the way out into the interior. And as they go into the interior, they clash with the Kaza. And so there were 23 different wars with the Kaza alone in a short span of time. And so the more they move into these territories where you have different ethnic groups, the more the clashes continue. What happened in 1806 is the British took over. Without a shot being fired, the British colonized South Africa, and it became a British country, no longer Dutch. 
And so in 1820, the Brits, here where Port Elizabeth is, where I was born, they settled groups of British people to come and farm the land. And so now you have an ethnic clash within the white community. White Afrikaners versus English-speaking people who have come and now dominating the land. And so the whites feel oppressed. They are being told by the English government that we're going to set slaves free in 1834. And so that happened in mass. All the slaves they had had to be set free. And the white farmers couldn't function without their slaves. They got all these rules explained to them and they said, we don't want to do this. And so the next picture, they left the great track. In their ox wagon, their chuck wagon, just like the American people, they dried their meat, beef jerky, they dried their uh, bread, biscotti, biscuit, from the Italian word. And so they had, their, they had their dried provisions, they had their dried meat, they would hunt along the way, they took their oxen and their cattle and everything with them, their slaves, etc. And they moved away from the Cape province to go wherever God would lead them. And they went in different directions. So this was 1838, the Great Trek. Next one. 1857, the Dutch Reformed Church. It's actually a misnomer. It's Dutch-German Reform because we come from both traditions. The DRC said in 1857 that separate worship is God's wish for us. Because the question came in, well, our workers, both colored and black, come to church with us. Because everybody had Bible study. At night, you take the big, huge Dutch Bible. You would open it. And worship was for the entire group. The kids, the slaves, the workers, everybody would hear God's word. So Bible study happened every single night after dinner. Whites and the blacks ate separate and they would all come together for worship. And so now the question is, should this worship continue in a church? And they said, no, it's God's wish that they are separate. So they started in 1881, the mission church for colored people. And in 1951, uh, the Reformed Church for black people. And later on, they had a church for Indian people. So the Dutch Reformed Church, the mother church, had three different churches and said, God wants you to worship within your ethnicity. Not language, because these people all spoke Afrikaans. But worshiping with them is not acceptable. And this is the foundational blocks of apartheid, of separate. Now I want to make a claim here this morning. Afrikaners did not invent apartheid. They perfected it because they learned it from the English. The English were the original ones who, who, who instilled the segregation. Whether it was in India, Pakistan, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Zambia, you name it. Afrikaners perfected that method of people being separate. Next one. What happened in 1886 is gold is discovered in Johannesburg. Big gold rush, the same as in the U.S. It draws people from all over. Next one. Anybody know what that is? A Kruger rand, because Paul Kruger was the president of the South African Union. And so gold was discovered. And of course, the English want to lay claim to the gold because Transvaal, Trans over the Vaal River, Transvaal, Transvaal was an independent Boer Republic. So the Boers have the gold. So the English, who only controlled the Cape Colony, then sent all their soldiers up to lay claim to this colony. The first Boer War. Next one. And so, what is the underbelly of apartheid? Migrant workers. They get workers from all over the country to come to the mines dig out the, 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 the gold. As they dig out gold, they discover coal. South Africa has the biggest coal deposit in the entire world. So coal feeds the economy. They later learn that you know, coal with the Industrial Revolution, etc., coal feeds an economy, and you can export the coal. They discover steel. So South Africa, with all the iron ore, makes steel, one of the biggest producers in the world of steel. And so these migrant workers come, but they're not allowed to bring their families. So their families would stay behind in the traditional areas. They would go home once a, a year for a month, get their wife pregnant. The wife looks after the kids. They stay local. The miners go back. Next one. So, I mean, these are the compounds that the men lived in. They were all together, squashed together. Prostitution happens. And it was actually supported by the mine owners. 
you have to service the needs of the men. So they would have legal prostitutes there. The men would sometimes take another wife and have a second family. And this is part of the legacy of apartheid. When you take people and you dehumanize them and you say, you cannot be with your family. Your family grows up separate from you. So the next generation of men who grow up have this image of, oh, I leave my family, I go to the mines, I work there, and I get my wife pregnant, but I have another wife and another family over there as well. And this is part of the brokenness that is still continuing in South Africa. The mine still works this way. The women and the men, for the most, live somewhere else far away from the men. And we're talking a million plus workers that still live in, in this sort of uh, forced uh, system. Next one. 1893, uh, Mohandras Gandhi comes to South Africa. He's a trained lawyer. And as he gets to South Africa, he discovers this racial undertone in everything. Of course, that racial undertone had existed in Britain, he uh, in, in India, by the British, comes to South Africa, and he starts this non-violent protest. And a lot of people just remember Desmond Tutu and Mandela, but they forget that Gandhi was there for 21 years. And he went back to India. And most of his non-violent thoughts and philosophy was formed in South Africa. And a big chance blow. And I mean, if he had become a Christian, as he had said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. That's what he's famous for saying. I like your Christ, but not your Christians. Next one. And so you have the republics. So you have a colony that's Bechuana land is Botswana. The Germans have German Southwest Africa. Transvaal is independent, Orange Free State independent, and KwaZulu-Natal belongs to the British. And so all these forces come together. Next one, with the Second Boer War <coughs> at the end of the century. And so Britain sends thousands of trained soldiers to South Africa. But they are used to fighting and showing up, and everybody shows up, and you wave your flag, and you start shooting one another. <laughs> but the Boers didn't follow that. They didn't get the memo. So they had guerrilla warfare. They would come in little groups of 20, 30, seize, shoot, move away. Come, contact, move away. And they were just faster at loading their weapons than the, than the commanders were. They were on horses. They were just excellent guerrilla warfare. And so it didn't work for the British. So the next thing they said is, well, if we can't defeat the men, we have to go to their weakness. And that's their farms and their women and their children. And so Lord Kitchener had a scorched earth policy. And that was, you burn all the fields and all the farmhouses down. That way you force the Boers to surrender. And they did. Thousands of farms were destroyed. Next one. And the next thing they said, well, we have to do something with these men, men, children and women. And they rounded them up in concentration camps, which was a precursor to what happened in Germany in the Second World War. And in these concentration camps, uh, lack of food, sanitary, water, etc., 28,000 to 32,000 women and children died. Now, if you're a small country with maybe like uh, uh, three-quarter million white people, every person has a family member that died in those concentration camps. And the hatred between white Afrikaans-speaking and white English-speaking existed for decades. Myself growing up, you could not date somebody that was English speaking. If uh, uh, Afrikaans speaking and English speaking married one another, they were persona non grata within their own families because of the difference that existed because of the Boer War. Whether they were family members of the ones who were in the war or not. Because most of the soldiers went back to England after the war. And so this hatred of what happened forged the Africana identity. They saw themselves as being persecuted. Their land was taken away. Their gold was taken away. Uh, Pretoria was taken over again without a single shot being fired and became an annex of uh, the British colony of, of England. And so you have to understand that when Africanus come into power later on, that they use that memory bank of the, how they were repressed and oppressed and did the exact same to other people. So, 1902, Boer War ends. Next one. 
South Africa becomes a union in 1910. And a union means that all these different republics are forced into one country. English rule, Afrikaners have a very uh, a bad voice in it, don't actually have a voice in the government. And so the Union of South Africa, which belongs to uh, England, just like Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, Uganda, Zambia, Tanzania, Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland. All of them were colonies of England. Next one. Can you show me where the gold was? Where was the gold? Go back. Where's the gold? There. Okay. Johannesburg. And interestingly enough, South Africa works this way because of the, the, the plates. The, the country was pushed up, and you have what's called an escarpment. Pretoria and Johannesburg are both higher than Denver. You, you smoke a golf ball there forever. <laughs> <laughs> and so when South Africa has teams playing there, they have an advantage. Because they come from coastal areas. New Zealand and Australia is very flat. And so when they play South African teams, they have to acclimate to that higher, uh, lesser air. But the ball travels forever. I mean, you can hit a golf ball there. That's the great thing. <laughs> and so that's on the escarpment, very high, uh, much drier. South Africa's weather, this is the cold Atlantic. Here you have the warm Indian Ocean. And so you have a lot of seal colonies there. And with seals, great white sharks. Some of the best cage diving is off the South African coast, we can get close to a 14 to 22 foot monster great white shark. Um, Indian Ocean, a lot of fish of Africa has cold water fish. They've got a fat skinny, a fat layer underneath their skin. Best fish ever. And then you have all the warm fish that is from the Indian Ocean current. And so South Africa has got this great coastline and great fish. Great uh, swimming, etc., etc. Okay, next one. 1912, the African National Congress is born. Well, if you're a union, you exclude blacks from it. Until that point, blacks have been subservient, although no longer slaves, but they have no voice in the governing of the country. So blacks are totally excluded, and they start the African National Congress. You have the spear, spear of the nation, you have the shield, and you have the colors, black, uh, green, and gold, and uh, the wheel. So that's the symbol of the African National Congress. Immediately in 1912, they are banned. You cannot have a black political party because you only allied white political parties. Next one. From 1884, what you see here is a list of acts that were enacted by the government to exclude black, colored, and later Indian from various aspects of life. I mean, just look at it. There's a hot tax. Then you have da, 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 Asiatic registration. If you're on, uh, from, from any country in Asia, you have to register. Then you have the Mine Worker Act, which means only the, the black men are allowed in the, in the mines, not the women. You have the Native Land Act, which I'm going to get to. You have the Native Urban Act, what happens in cities. You have uh, how are natives represented. Blah, blah, blah. The Immorality Amendment, 1950, Mixed Marriages Act, which we're going to get to. Next one. More acts. More than 60 <laughs> acts in that period enacted to exclude them from any form of government, from any form of mixed marriages, from any form of owning land. So this is, with these acts, I want to tell you how it happened. Go. 1923, the Natives Urban Areas Act. All urban areas are set and declared to be white areas. That means that black men must carry a passbook. You must have a document stating, why are you in a white area? Because I'm a mine worker. If you don't have a passbook, you get deported or sent to prison. Next one. 1948, Afrikaners for the first time outvote the English and it will stay that way from 1948 till deep in the 1990s that for 50 years Afrikaners become the majority voice of the country and so this is the architect of apartheid D.F. Milan and the, uh, Hendrik Verwoerd who uh, was the president in the 1960s and between the two of those guys they concocted what, what, what would become apartheid. Under Verwoerd and Milan, 
the, the Transvaal Synod of the Dutch Reformed Church said the following in 1948. Racial and national apartheid is in the Bible. And they come, not with New Testament, but with Old Testament text saying, it's God's wish that people are separate according to their ethnicity, their language, and their culture. And they base it on the Bible. And that decision by the Synod becomes basically the theological foundation for white and black should be separate from one another. You have white cities, the blacks live separate. Next one. Is the US, does the U.S. track before that, where the, they said it's Bible-based, that there's black and white, was that before this? And did the Africans get it from America, or was it at the same time? Or did we get it from them? Um, I think we arrived at it separately. And uh, so, th because they were very big on Scripture. And they had to give a theological foundation for why the separateness. And once the whites came into power, the Afrikaners, in 1948, they had to have a theological foundation for why they believed this. And this is why the church went to Scripture and said, Aha! We found the verses. Here are the verses. How did the Afrikaner government handle the British English speaking? Interesting thing. The Afrikaners were dirt poor. The depression had just devastated them. They were dirt poor. They had to find work. The English had the money. They controlled the businesses. So there was this hatred between Afrikaners and English. And what the government, Afrikaner government did is they put Afrikaans speaking people more and more into the government and gave them work. And so the government institutions in South Africa became the largest employer of Afrikaners. And the city, Pretoria, because that's the administrative capital. So Pretoria became an Afrikaner city. While Johannesburg, where the mines are, more an English-speaking city. So you had this, always this fight between uh, Pretoria and Johannesburg. Because Afrikaner culture versus British culture. So, in 1949, you had the Prohibition of, of Mixed Marriages Act, which was for the first time, just the year after Afrikaners came into power, black and colored and Indian cannot marry whites. It's illegal. If you do that, you get arrested, you get put in jail. In 1951, they had the Groups Areas Act, which said every group has to stay in a certain location. Whites stay here, Blacks, Indians, coloreds stay there. And I forgot to say, the Indians had come in the 1860s to Natal to work in the sugarcane plantations. And so they were either slaves that had come, uh, or freed slaves, or people that were indentured and had to pay off debt. And South Africa got a, a, a fourth group of people coming, namely the Indian population. And so you will see the Ons will summit alle rasse lewe. We want to live with all uh, different ethnicities. The Star, an English newspaper, more progressive. One million blacks wiped off South Africa's map. As people were moved, they think that three and a half million black people. Now you're talking maybe uh, like 15, 17 million at that stage in the country. You are moving 20% of the people in your country from where they've lived for centuries to what the Afrikaners said, this is your new home. You can no longer live here, you go live there. As I read uh, books, and I've been reading quite a bit the last week, three and a half million. And then they would go and say, well, it's no longer that, and they would build a white neighborhood where formerly it had been a black neighborhood. And they just forcefully, forcefully removed people from where they had been. There was no documents of land claim. So South African whites then claimed ownership of the land. Now that the country is coming through all this legalization and things, there's thousands of former land claims. The Kruger National Park, they just took it from local indigenous tribes, proclaimed it a wild uh, reserve, you couldn't hunt there, and now, 110 years after the fact, there's hundreds of land claims saying this was our ancestral land. You just took it from us. And we want recompensation for it. And that's the, the bad thing that's happening. Unlike Zimbabwe, where Mugabe just took land, 
in South Africa is going through the legal process at this moment, but the legal process is going to take decades to sort out. Because how do you prove it if you don't have documentation? And the older people get, the more the grandmothers and the great-grandmothers and fathers die out, and their stories cannot be validated. So how do you validate and say, hey, we lived there for 300 years, you moved us in the 1950s, we want our land back. Well, now you have a city or a farm that belongs to someone else. How do you compensate people? Especially in a country where the, where the, where the government doesn't have the funds to compensate everybody. So it's a very thorny issue. Next one. The Bantistans. They said, well, blacks want to congregate together. Let's do that. Let's create homelands for black people. And so in 1951, with this Groups Area Act, you had all the forced relocations. And they moved people, and you'll see in the next slide what it is. So the Bantu Self-Governing Act came into be in 1959. Separate development, self-governing, and yet 13% of the land belonged to 80% of the people. And the other 87% belonged to white people. So you'll see the map. This is what they did. They created independent homelands like uh, Siske, KwaZulu-Natal, um, Bhutatswana, and they created these little pockets of land, Labova, and said, this is your ancestral land, and we move you there. These pieces of land are 13% of the entire country, and often some of the poorest land. And so, because of overgrazing with cattle, sheep, goats, overplanting, the, the soil erosion in the last 60 years is tremendous. They didn't have fertilizer. They didn't get government subsidies. They got leaders appointed by the South African white government saying, this is your new leader, this is your leader, this is your leader, this is your leader. And so the leaders were in the pocket of the government. And the leaders enriched themselves at the cost of their own very people. They had their own police force. So self-governing, own police force, you couldn't vote. You can't vote for somebody that the whites put in place. You can't vote for another leader to come up. And so you can understand in these years of the African National Congress, etc., how this resistance built not just against the white government, but against the own blacks that they put over them, including soldiers and police uh, officers, etc. And so this thing is building, building, building. Next one. Until we get to 1952 with the pass law that says all blacks over the age of 16 must at all times have a passbook on their person. Any police officer or military officer can stop you. If you don't have a passbook, you are immediately arrested. From 1910 to 1983, 18 and a half million people were arrested and put in jail. Eighteen and a half million people. That means you go to jail. They didn't inform your family. So your family is like, well, why don't you come home tonight? So the family goes to every local police station trying to find you. And this is the scary thing of what happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. People disappeared. And the government was under no obligation to tell your family what they'd done with you. And so your family literally had to go search for you until they found you. And when they found you, they had to pay a fine because you didn't have your passport. And so, down with pass laws, in the 70s, people en masse burnt their passports, threw them in the fire and said, arrest us. See if you can arrest a million, two, three, four million people for not having a passport. Where are you going to have these jails that can accommodate so many millions? This is the, the negative of, you can understand, this, this, this vitriolic hatred because we are deemed not to be human beings. <coughs> Next one. Dr. Favurt was the Minister of Education. He had come from Holland and was a big Nazi supporter. In fact, a lot of the teachings of Nazi, of Himmler, etc., he believed that. So he was the education minister, and he said at one point, natives must be taught from an early age that equality with Europeans is not for them. 
And so in 1953, he wrote the Bantu Education Act, saying all blacks must be educated in Afrikaans. Not English, Afrikaans. And the second thing, all blacks will be educated till the age of 18. And then it stops. You can't go to university, to college, because we're not going to give you a job. You don't need education. We need to give them vocational jobs to how to be a good uh, cleaner or a mine worker or a gardener or a driver, etc., etc. You don't need education. And so Bantu Education Act basically said in 53, all education stops at the age of 18. Only whites are allowed to go to university. Next one. So what happened in 1960 is this protest against Afrikaans education. So you have to speak and learn the language of the one who dominates you. And in the Sharpeville protest, 69 people were killed. And this is the first time that people in the U.S. took notice of what was happening. It's the first time that the apartheid uh, regime was actually exposed to the world when these photos made it onto the world scene, including the U.S. Next one. Uh, typical police officers with their hats, with their uniforms, uh, beating people. Next one. People running away from the police. Next one. And this is where Nelson Mandela comes in. Um, he is a, a, a Kosa prince from a royal family. His name is not Nelson. It was actually what happened is all whites gave blacks another name. Your mine worker, your domestic worker, your gardener. And a school teacher actually gave him the name Nelson. And the name Nelson just stuck. And so Nelson Mandela comes from the Eastern Cape. He's from uh, uh, royal heritage and very bright. He, along with Walter Sisulu, became the first two black lawyers in the entire country. And they opened the law practice. And so Mandela was there for the underdog. Next one. Uh, photo of Walter Sisulu and Nelson Mandela. Next one. And in 1961, he did it before the act was enacted. Okay. Yeah. And he went to a black college in the Eastern Cape and was allowed to practice law. And so in 1961, he founded MK, Nkonto Esizwe, the Spear of the Nation, which means that the African National Congress is going to do a deliberate attack on the white government by going after soft targets like um, electricity supplies, um, bombing them, acts of terror. And so with a deliberate effort, Mkonto Assis were sent their Iskari overseas to countries like Tanzania, Uganda, uh, Cuba, Russia. And so they were trained by them how to be operatives, how to uh, blow up um, railways and disrupt the, the, the coal and the steel and the stuff that had to go to Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, Durban and Richards Bay, which were the four big harbors. If you can't get the stuff from Johannesburg to your harbors, you ha don't have exports. And so the act of terror was blowing up these lines of transportation, communication and electricity supply. And of course, you catch an AMC, ANC or in Conte Siswe, immediately jailed. So Mandela was never a student of Gandhi, the, the uh, no. passive tactic. And it was a good question, Bob. They asked him why, and he said, if we f follow the pacifism of Gandhi, our country will never change. And it was a deliberate decision to go to a violent struggle and do these acts of terror to try and get the government to negotiate with them. So this was 1961. Next one. He was caught in 1962. He was called the Black Pimpernel. Americans had the Scarlet Pimpernel, or the English. He was called the Black Pimpernel. He was like a thief in the night. Nobody knew who he was. He had all this um, uh, um, um, disguises. disguises that he had and finally was caught. The Ravonia trial happened and he was imprisoned for life in 1963 and sent to Robben Island in 64 to do hard labor. And this is a physical photo of hard, uh, of hard labor where you had a little hammer, you had the rocks, and they had to pound the rocks. And for 18 of his years, that's what he did, pounding rocks. And all that dust caused the, the eyesight problems he has and the lung infection that he's at this moment dying of because all that dust came into their lungs. And this is hard labor, 
physical labor that he did. Next one. This is the little prison cell. Now, Mandela is 6'3". This prison cell is barely uh, longer than from that side to here. There's no mattress on the floor. You sleep on the ground. For 19 of the years, he slept on the ground. Concrete. Concrete. Um, next one. This is Mandela's famous photo reminiscing about his time in prison. I knew nothing about him. I learned about Mandela when I was in college, when I was 19 years old. I learned about him for the first time. And you'll say, why? Well, the South African government did exactly what the Germans did. They controlled the news, television, radio, print, everything. The newspapers, government owned. Whether it was black, English, or Afrikaans newspapers. They controlled the television. South Africa only got television in 1976. And they controlled what came out. You had an Afrikaans, English, and a black station. Three stations only. They censored all news that was released. And so, you never knew about him. In fact, no photos of him were released in the 27 years that he was imprisoned. Where's Holly? Holly worked for AP, said, you know, they would phone us, get us a photo. There is no photo. So what they did, all the banners, is photos of how they thought he had aged over that time. Not a single photo released in 27 years. He became this mythical figure. And the more they clamped him down from the world, the more his status among all blacks in South Africa just grew. And they were hoping for this uh, 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 dream that one day he would be released. Next one. So Favort was the president in the 1960s, and he fully enforced apartheid, separate development, <laughs> segregation. And, I mean... This guy, just every aspect of life was segregated. Um, and you grow up not asking the questions, isn't this normal? You have a housework who comes in, she goes home at night. You have a gardener who comes in on the Saturday, they go home in the day. You go to a white school, blacks have their own school. Whites live here, blacks live over there. And you're not really taught to ask why. It's just, that's the way it is. And you're so force-fed that BS that you never question it until some started to question it in the 70s, both black and white, and when the U.S. and England and these countries started to question it. Because you knew more than we did. Because all our information was controlled. In fact, the only way that some people would get information was not with FM, but with AM. Because the AM radio signal frequency goes further. They would transmit that from Mozambique, or from Angola, or from Zimbabwe, into South Africa. Because the FM stations are controlled by the government. Questions? Uh, Asians too? Yes. Some Asians were seen as white. Uh, mm -hmm. Chinese were seen as white, but Japanese not as white. They were seen as non-white. <laughs> and then, what happened is, everybody got an identity book. Besides the past book, everybody got an identity book. And in the identity book, your ethnicity was specified. So 001 means white, 002 means colored, 003 means black, 004 means other. And so everybody's ethnicity was in the identification number. So my identification number is 670825509500 uh, means I'm white. And when I was born. And everybody had that identity tag of this is your ethnicity. And the government decided whether you were white, black, colored, or yeah. whatever. If they knew Mandela had influence, why did they not kill him? It's an interesting question that they, 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 the, the, the circumstances were that he, had not, he was found guilty of high treason and not of murder, and that's why he got a life imprisonment. That, that, should, that didn't stop the Nazis, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> surprised this guy didn't just execute him. Yeah. And it, it is, but when you read it, it was high treason, it wasn't murder. And that's why he got a life in prison. Steve? I might go back, but Nelson was the founder... Uh, in of Inkontu, of, of Spear of the Nation, the, the armed struggle. Got it. He was the ANC youth leader. Right. ANC youth can go up to 35 years of age. So he was the, the, the youth leader of the ANC and founded Inkontu Asizwe, the armed struggle. And when he was...
was arrested, it was only as a member of the organization, or was there a specific act he was also Well, uh, several others were arrested with him. Walter Sisulu, etc., and they all went to prison with him, Just to Robben Island. Member. That entire group from Ravonia, about 15, went to prison. Okay, next one. Weren't you saying that he was only in, in sort of control for a year before he was arrested? Basically, yeah. Hmm. In Konto was founded in 61, he was arrested in 62. He came back into the country and they actually found him. So this is what you grew up with. For use by whites only, blancas, white skins, and this was put everywhere. All public places, swimming, beaches, you name it. There was segregation based on this is the order and only white people can go here. Next one. So the ANC is in a, a unique situation that they took support from whenever they could get it. And this support defines still who they are today. So that support from the Communist Party. It's one of the few countries in the world that still you can be a communist and it's legal. And then from the Mine Workers Union, COSATU, and from the ANC itself. So all of these work together. South Africa's president is not elected by the people. The president is elected by the party. So the party puts forth a person that they want to be the president. And then you vote for the party. It's the same way in England. You don't choose the Prime Minister of England. You choose Labour or Conservative Party, and then they put their Prime Minister forth. South Africa works the same way. Next one. So, in 1972, the Dutch Reformed Church, to whom I belong, put out a document, Ras, Folk, in Nazi, Race, People, and Nation, Relationships in Light of Scripture. And for the first time, the bigger denomination of the church said, Apartheid, separate people, Separate development is scriptural. It's what God wants for us. And that became the bottom line of apartheid in the 1970s. Next one. So in June 1976, we just celebrated it uh, as Youth Day in South Africa, the Soweto uprising against Afrikaans education. 176 dead, unofficially maybe 700, all unarmed. Most of them shot in the back, the autopsies revealed later. And this is what shocked the entire world. Um, the, 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 the senseless killing of people protesting Afrikaans only education in Soweto. This photo of a young man carrying this uh, young woman's brother made it to all the newspapers in the world. The photos were smuggled out. And this was the shocking effect of, of apartheid. Next one. We don't want Afrikaans. Thousands showed up and they just uh, started uh, shooting them. Next one. Me in 1980. Nice to pay. Nice to pay. I had blonde hair. Okay, 1980. Clueless. All of this is happening around you, but you are just unaware of what's happening because nobody shares and nobody tells you. Next one. How old were you? In that? I was 13. The guy with the finger. P. W. Boeta. The guy with the fat finger. There's a story about him. There was this uh, 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 crocodile that, that uh, uh, ate people. And he sent out the police and the military and the army, everyone to catch this man-eating crocodile. And they couldn't find him. And finally they found it. And they brought back a, a leg one. A leg one is a lizard, a water lizard. And it is said that they beat the lizard so badly that it finally confessed, Okay, I'm a crocodile. <laughs> and this is what he did. His army, his military force, had all the weapons for torture within it. They would have the tubes where they would physically do waterboarding in those trucks. And waterboard people with tubes forced down their throat and would drown people until they gave up, whether they were ANC, etc., etc. It was a mobile torture chamber that went into the cities. P.W. Bota, may he rest in hell forever, even if I don't believe in it. Um, absolute vitriolic. Um, the way he clamped down on the country. Go on, next one. In 1985, he had his uh, um, meeting with Mandela. And we didn't know about it, only after the fact that it came out, that he met with Mandela and said, I will release you conditionally if you swear off the armed struggle. And Mandela said, no. 
everything was set for Mandela to be released, and he said, no, I would rather stay in prison than give up the armed struggle, because you are not guaranteeing me anything. You're just saying, get out of prison. And Mandela stayed in prison for another couple of years. Next thing, Pretoria bombings. Um, the, the ANC stepped up its armed struggle because PW Bota just clamped down on everything. And so the Pretoria bomb, uh, the main street in Pretoria, uh, just exploded. And from then on, it was a reign of terror. The ANC in all malls, they would just go plant a bomb. You would hear weekly of bombs exploding. Um, it wasn't strange to be in a movie theater and be evacuated because phone call came in as a bomb. Schools were evacuated. All malls, all schools had metal detectors that you were, had to walk through. Uh, everywhere there was armed police officers, army, all on call. In the midst of this, South Africa was fighting two wars. It was fighting a war in Mozambique against communism. It was fighting a war in Angola via Namibia against SWAPU, Southwest African People Organization, who had help from Russia and the Cubans. And so what happened is America, because they had to have a bulwark against communism, supported South Africa. They gave money, they gave funds, they supported Renamo and Frelimo in both Mozambique and in Angola to support South African troops. And so who was loved in South Africa? Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Because they had the same conservative ideology as P.W. Boeta. And Reagan and Thatcher often went to South Africa and often pronounced their support for South Africa because they were this bulwark against communism. Next one. 1986, Boeta gathers all the world's media. And everybody's expecting he's going to announce the release of Mandela. And what does he do? He announces a total clampdown, a state of emergency. In his famous Rubicon speech, a river in Italy that uh, was said to be crossed, he didn't cross the river and he said, I'm sending in the army, the military, the police force into all black neighborhoods. Everything is clamped down. There's uh, 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 from 10 o'clock to 6 in the morning, nobody can get out of the township. And he sends in the police. It is murder and mayhem and crazy. We still don't know how many thousands of people died in that period that he had the state of emergency. And the next thing, all American and British companies say, we divest. There's pressure on the American Congress and Senate to divest. But here's the interesting thing. A book I just finished yesterday says, it was only a name change. So ExxonMobil divested, but then they would come back as mobile. Coca-Cola divested. You could still buy Coke. Kodak divested. You could still buy Kodak camera and film. In fact, it was the only camera and film available. So what they did is they just put another company in charge and came back that way. So even though all Americans were told that you had divested from South Africa, you did not divest. The prophets spoke louder than action. And the prophets still came and went out of the country. So nothing much changed. The only thing that really changed was oil. There was an oil embargo. And so South Africa got oil from Mobile and from uh, um, uh, Shell and via Iraq. And the way that we did is we said to Iraq, let's give you weapons in exchange for oil. Those weapons were w used in the first Gulf War against the U.S. The cannons that South Africa developed. Okay. So, terrible, army comes in, next one. 1986, I'm a first year student. Quibi and I had finished high school the previous year. In January of 1986, our Dutch Reformed Church comes together. This was my dogmatics professor, my systematic theology professor. And he was the moderator of the General Assembly and they made a few big decisions, including saying that apartheid is a sin, that it is not God's wish for people, the next thing is, which goes against this entire paternalistic male chauvinist culture is, women can be pastors and elders. Which is used because my wife is now in seminary and she can't be a pastor until they make that vote. And he, go back, assassinated uh, on uh, Guy Fawkes Day, November the 5th, 1994. I was out camping. My first call, camping with the youth, was assassinated by a right wing in front of his grandchildren playing cards because of his role of ending apartheid and ending apartheid as a theology of the church. Next one. 1986, just after the South African white church makes its uh, uh, comments that apartheid is a sin and we can no longer have race, people, and nation as our document, the colored church comes and says the Belhar Confession. 
That our confession is, it criticizes apartheid as a sin. God is on the side of the oppressed and the downtrodden. And the church should stand up to all power and be on the side of the oppressed. The colored church accepts the document. The Dutch Reformed Church, till today, has refused to accept it. And we as Presbyterians voted it down, and we couldn't get a majority to accept it as a confession. And so what it means is, the colored and later the black church became one church, the uniting church. And they still say, for us to become one church, we need you to accept Belhar. And the Dutch Reformed Church still refuses till this day. So what's happened? You still don't have one unified church in South Africa. Is it even a close issue? I mean, is it a 49-51? Oh, it's big. It's still big. So there's yeah. huge gaps. They're still dissatisfied with the wording of it. They want some of the wording changed. And Ballard says, we're not going to change the wording. So next one. 1988. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, the photo just makes me skinnier. <laughs> it's a long photo. Look at the hip hairdo now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all doffed up for the wedding day. 88. We'll be married 25 years in December. So uh, this is the woman who changed my, my eyes. She grew up extremely poor on a little small holding. Now her parents were the poorest of the poor. Now if the poorest of the poor can support three black families, that gives you an idea how poor the blacks are. So her great-grandfather had a piece of land uh, divided among the 14 children, the 14 children divided among their kids, so about 70 family members all had a small holding. And it's about five hectares, the small holding, three families. And Quibi grew up questioning everything. She's my bubble burster. If I have an idea, she'd kung, kung, kung. <laughs> she'd, I, I just look for what survives and then go with it. And she questioned everything. You've heard a priest, she said, I was driving in the bus and the kids were shouting these abuses at the black kids and this is their school with all the broken windows. Who would want to go to a school like that? And she questioned it by engaging them and asking them. And so Joseph, their black farm worker, would have his own tin cup and tin plate. And Quibi would bring him coffee in a dad's cup. And the dad would throw it away. And the next time in a dad's cup, and he'd throw it away. Until he had no cups left. <laughs> And uh, Kubi would question it. When I met this woman, she changed my entire perception because she knew so much more than I did. What happened is th um, there was a news agency, central news agency that sold, like Staples, newspaper, magazines, uh, uh, stationery. Central news agency. And the opposite of ANC. And she started working there when she was 14 years old with her uh, great aunt. We illegally employed her because she had to be 16. And the workers there came all by bus 4 o'clock in the morning and by taxi, started their shift at 8 o'clock, left at 5 o'clock, got home at 7 o'clock, and they were all just the packers. And as Kubi got to know them, she convinced her aunt to give one of the women, Beauty, an opportunity to be the first cashier. Now this central news agency was the biggest in the entire South Africa. And uh, uh, um, uh, Grace. Grace became the first black cashier in the entire country. My wife. She convinced her racist aunt to give Grace a chance. Grace went then to be the assistant floor manager. And then she became the floor manager. And that changed things. Because Quibi knew their story. She heard about their heartache, their brokenness, their hopes and their dreams. These women would suffer. They would spend nothing on themselves so that their children could go to university and have a better future. And this woman changed my entire life. She changed me that I am a recovering racist. Next one. The talks were held 1990. Mandela was finally released. The entire world stopped to witness that he was released. Nobody knew what he would look like. And there was this euphoric thing. And yet, despite this euphoria, what came out later is that the white government took a lot of money, had a third force of black people stir up unrest between ANC and Inkata, Inkata Freedom Party, uh, IFP, from KwaZulu-Natal. And that there was this racial clash, and that they were the third force behind it. They think about 30,000 people died in that four, five-year span. 
um, be between these rival clashes that was fed most likely by the government. Uh, terrible. I mean, more people died in those four years when Mandela was released than the entire time before. Were both are still in power in 1990? Uh, no, he, he had had, God had given him a seizure. <laughs> And, and who replaced him? F.W. the clerk. Oh, yeah, the clerk. And the clerk seized power when uh, Buerta had a seizure. Seized power, became the president and said, we have to talk. We have to talk about negotiating with the ANC. They put a group together. They went to Tanzania and said, we have to talk. They went to Dar es Salaam. We have to talk. We have to transition and prepare the whites for transition. Next one. And so in October 1990, after Mandela had been released, the judge reformed church. This is now four years after saying apartheid is a sin. They wrote a document called Church and Society. Any attempt by a church to try to defend a system of separation, biblically and ethnically, must be seen as a serious errancy. That is to say, it is in conflict with the Bible. And in November 1990, the Dutch Reformed Church did a public confession of guilt of what they had done. And of course the debate is, well, who gave them power? Who gave some of the leaders power? Sometimes it was the moderator, sometimes it was a group leader, and it was this conflict. Was it a real forgiveness? Did that person have the authority? But the Dutch Reformed Church came to a point where it says, we have to confess that we were part and parcel of causing and upholding apartheid. And we call it a sin. And that's a proud moment for my church to come to to be able to face up and stand up. Gilbert. How Mandela became a Christian? He uh, was raised as a Methodist <coughs> and in prison continued to go to worship services his entire uh, time in prison as a Methodist. And you know what impressed me most? Because I didn't know about him. I only learned about it as these facts came out. He cared about people. He cared about the wardens. He cared about the fellow prisoners. Because he was an attorney, the, 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 the wardens would come and say, I've got a legal problem. He would write letters. I want to get my child into college. He would write letters on their behalf. He remembered people's names, their, 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 their birthdays. He would celebrate people as human beings. And this is why a lot of the guards that, that took over Robben Island as, 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 as uh, uh, guests, uh, tutors, were his former prisoners, uh, former prison guards, who said that he treated us with so much dignity. And that's the thing he said, you can put me in prison, but you can't take my human being, my dignity away. And I will not do to you what you did to me. Jesus. Yeah. Next one. New flag four days before the election. The colors of the ANC, black, yellow, green. The sun, the white of peace and blue, the skies. And South Africa has a new flag. It's an upside down Y. New flag that was revealed. Next one. Elections on the 27th. There was no batteries, no candles, no generators, no bottled water, no spam. There was nothing in the stores. Whites had gone and built little bunkers in their houses. Everybody was preparing for a siege of two to three years for civil violence to erupt. And it was peaceful. Nobody killed. People stood in line for eight to twelve hours to vote. And I tell you, nothing made me prouder that night to hear the election results and to see that this country can truly be a democracy. ANC, of course, overwhelmingly won the vote. Question? But that's after four years. You said there's like four years before this. Oh, yeah. Terrible violence. Terrible. Uh, as Dave has preached before, the Inkata Freedom Party, until a week before, with Butelezi, who was put up by the white government, said, we're not going to participate. We're going to boycott the vote. And Christian leaders came and Political parties came, and the day or two before the election, they said, okay, let's vote. And they went out to vote. There was so much corruption with the vote that, in the fact, in the first election, they gave in Carter like 10% of the vote. In the next elections, they got less than 2% because they realized the vote had been rigged with the first election, and they just didn't want unrest. So they said, we give you 10% of the representation. But the next ones, they just disappeared. Unimportant little party. No, with regard to the uh, Mandela's Conto was this way. Yes. In the 1960s, early 60s, in the University of Moscow, Russians were taught Afrikaans. Yes. Because oh they have some plans. Yeah. I have to finish up. I have to go preach. Next one. Dutch Reformed Church, my first congregation in Vereniging where the Boer War 
peace accord was signed. Hmm. I've preached about it. I had a black American pastor, married a local black woman, was ostracized by the black community because he was American, came to the church, we became friends, he came to worship, and the next thing, communion, he became the first congregant in a hundred years to ever receive communion. Black person. And that was my, um, my breakthrough in my congregation's life, saying this is a new opportunity. And the moment I left this congregation in 1996, they closed the doors and said, no blacks welcome. Oh, no. Next one. 1996, terrible. The truth of what had happened, like Nuremberg in Germany, had to come out. Bishop Tutu and Alex Borain, uh, uh, um, uh, a Supreme Court judge with the co-chairs, and for three months they went around the country, and people could get blanket amnesty for any deeds they'd done. You had to come and testify, tell the truth, confess, and then you were in, had indemnity. You couldn't go to prison. And it was shocking. I tell you, it was shocking. The stuff that came out night after night after night of the terrible atrocities. Um, next one. This, this, this night, it just broke me. Bishop Tutu was on TV and he couldn't speak. He had heard so much that day that he just broke down in tears on TV and he just cried. And that's all they could show. There were no words to describe the atrocities that they'd heard with that Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Next one. It came out that Colonel de Coutsia ran Flakplas, shallow farm. And Flakplas was a government torture chamber. They had the black police officers, white police officers, he was military, and they tortured people there. Um, the story is of the, how they burned somebody and had a barbecue next to it and had their meat barbecued while they were barbecuing somebody alive. The, the humanity was just stripped. He uh, asked for amnesty, got amnesty, and then went to the UK. But the terrible, terrible, terrible things that they did. Next one. Uh, ah, Mr. Dirk could see it. What a resume. We look forward to your expert opinion. <laughs> the fires of hell reception uh, area, because he knows how to torture people. Zapiro, famous satirist. Next one. World Cup. Mandela knew that World Cup could unite this nation, truly become a rainbow nation. He supported the, 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 the Springboks. They, of course, won the Rugby World Cup. There's a lot of talk that um, there was food poisoning of uh, the Kiwis, <laughs> of the All Blacks. Um, South Africa won the World Cup. Euphoric. Blacks have started to participate. There's a lot of blacks in the South African rugby team. It's making its comeback. Uh, that was really big nation building and wearing the number six like Francois Pinot, that said a lot of Mandela's character. Next one. His vice president was Tom Mbeki. He's famous for ignoring AIDS and saying, well, I did all my research. Uh, uh, HIV doesn't cause AIDS. No to, uh, to AZT drugs. Ignore the scientific evidence. Wacko websites. And he did his research over two weeks. He went online and he came back and the council that Mandela had put into place, because South Africa has a 28% HIV AIDS infection rate. And Mbeki came and said, no, HIV is not caused by sex. It's caused by poverty. <laughs> and because we don't have money, who caused poverty? The whites. Let's blame it on them. So HIV is caused by poverty. And we can't do much about poverty because we didn't cause it. And so, you know, if you have a president that, that has this type of idea, the next president, go, is Jacob Zuma, who's a Zulu, who is a mine worker, who came through the Mine Workers Union. He's not a politician. This is again Zapiro the satirist. The reason you have a shower head there is Zuma has four wives. He had unprotected sex with a woman who has HIV and then afterwards took a shower. And so in all the comic strips that Sapiro draws, he always will have the shower head on his head. <laughs> That's what he's known for. For unprotected sex, this is the president of the country. His, one of his four wives was the minister of health. And of course, Zuma, Zuma, she divorced him because of his stupidity. I have no respect for him. I think he is a buffoon of a leader. He, he stands up for Mugabe. He stands up for corruption. He himself has been indicted, got off. He was indicted for rape. He was indicted for uh, arms trade with, with, with France. 
And the moment that the claims were dropped, he disbanded the entire team that was supposed to look uh, at the claims. Um, this is AIDS message. The shower head wipes away, abstain, be faithful, and use a condom. I just hope that the next president is a better leader. He's the current one. He can only serve two terms. He's tried to change the constitution, but it, they're not getting it through. So I hope that the next leader will be somebody in the sense of Mandela. When is the next election? Uh, I think it's like a year away. Yeah. Mandela is dying, and that's a sad moment for me. Um, How does anybody replace he, him in, in terms of uh, vision and leadership? And in a sense, uh, Archbishop Tutu. Mandela was born on the same day as my wife's grandmother. Their stories could not be different. And so will you pray with me? God, as we remember the, the atrocities of South Africa, and yet beauty has come from that. A man has come forth as a leader of people. And so we pray for Madiba. We pray for his family. We pray for a nation, for a nation that is in uncertainty and a nation that has been forged by his life, his leadership and his example. May the grace and the forgiveness that Madiba has shown a nation and the world become an example for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. With that, friends, go in peace and serve the Lord.